It's prediction time, baby. So we're talking offensive predictions for Florida or South Carolina, then defensive, and then we'll talk about a few Gators in the NFL that have been killing the game, specifically the passing game this year, only here on Locked On Gators. You are Locked On Gators, your daily podcast on the Florida Gators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Lockdown Gators, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Lockdown Gators your first listen of the day, available daily and free wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode of Lockdown Gators is brought to you by McDonald's, proudly serving communities since 1965. McDonald's has always been more than just a place to get tasty, affordable food. It's an unofficial community center. A big thank you to our friends at McDonald's for always being there. I'm loving it. Happy Thursday. I am Brandon Olson. You can find me on Twitter at WNS underscore Brandon. I am also the founder of Whole9Sports.com, where you can find all of my written work. Getting right into the offensive predictions here, over 250 rushing yards. That's the easiest one for me. I, I hope that Dan Mullen has realized now that if we run the ball, we will find success against pretty much anyone i think that i think that's safe to say that uh, this team can find success against pretty much anyone running the ball so there's that we're the only team this season that has averaged four yards or more versus georgia and we had the most rushing yards versus them this season the second team to go over 100 rushing yards i believe uab had it first and they had more carries than we did so yeah this this is the best gators rushing attack that a lot of teams have seen the best rushing attack that a lot of teams have seen we are still to this day the only team this season to crack 100 rushing yards against Alabama, including the game that they lost against Texas A&M, in which A&M had 96 rushing yards, and we had 246 rushing yards. That is not a fluke. That is not a, oh, wow, just a couple big runs. That is Florida put it up without Anthony Richardson, who at the time was averaging about 25 yards per carry. Uh, and then we didn't have him in the Alabama game. South Carolina's run defense is porous we could take advantage of that big time again this is the best gators rushing attack that we've seen in a very long time possibly ever I, it's i'm just saying possibly ever when they actually get the damn ball give the ball to damian pierce malik uh davis naquan right emory jones if anthony richardson's there give him the ball jacob copeland jordan pouncey i don't give a damn just run the ball we were very good at it, especially those wide runs and the option runs. They work. Last week, the speed option just didn't work that much. It was Florida it was trying to work it in. Didn't really happen the way that they expected it to. But this is still a very good rushing attack when they are given the opportunity to be a good running team. The passing game, I think, on Saturday is going to have a, a bit of a down game. South Carolina's past events has been pretty solid recently especially over the past two or three weeks they've been really stepping up not giving up huge plays consistently you know not not allowing any easy completions for the most part texas a.m texas a&m has some solid playmakers similar to florida's receivers although i do think our receivers are a bit better but i think that they might have um i i think they're one of those teams where they have a, a better top level and then worse depth whereas we just have phenomenal depth and we haven't really had a receiver that breaks out as that elite number one guy but they texas a&m really struggled to get a passing game going versus south carolina last week and that is i mean that's good for south carolina that's that's the team that beat bama granted it wasn't totally passing the ball but that's still the team that beat bama and south carolina played very good passing defense against them uncertainty at quarterback for florida is i think another reason that this passing game is going to have a down game because anthony richardson has not as reportedly not practiced since the georgia loss which he got injured in of course and we still don't know the extent of the injury because at the time of recording this dan mullen has not given an update on it because he only had that one press conference and they didn't get to it so there's that but uh yeah this i think the passing game is going to have a down game because if emory comes in we're not going to take deep shots. We're going to keep it short. And 
I'd imagine that South Carolina is going to play a lot of cover zero, cover one, and Emory has, specifically Emory, has struggled against cover one this season. Anthony Richardson hasn't played enough of it for me to say he's struggling or performing well, but Emory Jones, I can definitively say, has struggled against cover one this year. So if South Carolina has Emory Jones in the backfield, I I don't know what's going to happen there with the passing attack. I don't think it'll be good. And I will say that there will be at least one Florida Gators turnover this year, this week, um, because that's just how it works. It's going to happen. We don't know how we don't know when we don't know who is going to turn it over. We don't know who is going to get the turnover, but it's going to happen. Florida has had zero, zero, Z-E-R-O turnover free games this year. And they've played some not fantastic uh, defenses this year. So, yeah, this is, that's just like the easiest slam dunk prediction you can get. I know that I used to say no turnovers and I'd be like, oh, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. And then I quickly realized it ain't going to happen. They're probably going to turn the ball over. And honestly, since I'm saying there's at least one turnover, I'm probably going to be wrong, and so you are welcome, Florida, for not turning the ball over this week in advance. But just to recap the offensive predictions, 250-plus rushing yards for Florida's rushing attack. The passing game will have a down game, one, because I hope that we will run the ball more, and two, I mean, not even and two, two, South Carolina's pass defense has been very good recently, and three, Emory Jones starting, Anthony Richardson starting, we don't know because Anthony Richardson's hurt, but we don't know to what extent, we just know hasn't practiced, and there will be at least one Gators turnover because, again, death, taxes, and Florida turning the ball over, three guarantees in life that you get. We're about to get to defensive predictions, but first, you know that I grew up around a McDonald's. I've said it multiple times, but now I went around the block when I was a kid, and I'd go to McDonald's three, four times, two, three times a week. I don't even care. I just went whenever I wanted to go, and now... Granted, I generally go under the influence of things, uh, but that's not a knock on McDonald's. That's a knock on me, <laughs> if we're being honest. Uh, but yeah, I used to go two to three times a week after school with my friends and go home, play video games for a few hours because I was a ne'er-do-well. And that was how I pretty much went. I used to go and just, I would look forward to it because I would have conversations with the manager of the McDonald's, who was the son of the owner. And we would spend legitimate like an hour or two there just talking. I know I grabbed some the other night. It was delectable. Had a McFlurry yesterday, you know, after date night. It was fun. Head to your local McDonald's to refuel and reconnect. Did someone say a Lockdown Gators watch party? But I'm loving it. Thanks for making Lockdown Gators your first listen of the day every day. We are free and available daily wherever you listen to podcasts and on YouTube, looking at defensive predictions, at least one interception for the Florida Gators defensively. We know they're probably going to throw one offensively, but I think that the Gators will at least get a pick this year or this week. Why? Gators have five interceptions in the past four games. Rashad Torrance has been a complete menace to opposing quarterbacks, which is fantastic. He's been playing lights out the past really three or four weeks or three or four games, not weeks because we had a bye. The last three or four games, he's been playing absolutely lights out, fantastic football from him. South Carolina, similar to Georgia, is likely going to have to push the ball downfield at some point in the game, except actually not even really similar to Georgia because Georgia didn't have to do that at all. They had the win, but they did push downfield. I think South Carolina is not going to have the lead and they're going to have to push the ball downfield, in which case, hopefully, Rashad Torrance just stays ready for it. So hopefully someone in the secondary will be able to make a play, whether it's Rashad Torrance, Kair Elam, who, by the way, should just have like acrobat and mad in the way he gets his picks and his deflections. So just going to say that. But I think that we can at least grab one pick against South Carolina, no matter who is their starting quarterback this week. South Carolina will have less than 100 rushing yards. I realize that doesn't sound like a huge thing to say about South Carolina because they're not generally thought of as a great offensive team, but South Carolina has cracked 100 or more rushing yards in five of their eight games this season, and against Georgia, they had almost 100 rushing yards. So South Carolina, their rushing attack is better than people have given them credit for. It's that their passing attack is so piss poor 
that you could just say, hey, their offense isn't going to do much against you, which is wrong. But I think a lot of the teams they've played against don't have defensive lines that are nearly as good as Florida's defensive line has been this year, specifically just looking at the interior with guys like Daquan Newkirk, Antonio Valentino, Javon Dexter, and then you've got Zachary Carter and Brenton Cox Jr. When he wants, when he wants to play football, Brenton Cox Jr. is pretty good, but he just like doesn't give a damn sometimes if we're going to be honest about it. I think that this game, I've said it yesterday, I will say it today, and I will say it tomorrow. I think this game, a lot of it is going to come down to our linebackers being able to come up, read, and react, and diagnose where that ball is going, come up and finish the plays made by our defensive line, because I do think our defensive line will get a strong push at the point of attack, meaning that that running backs are going to have to make cuts and dance around the backfield a little bit, hopefully, because, again, I pointed out yesterday, South Carolina's interior offensive line is very, very um, bad. It just, just to be blunt about it, they're very bad. And our defensive line interior is very, very good. So hopefully we can kind of demolish their zone rushing scheme at that point. Just let linebackers come down, fly in, and actually... Here's something that I want our linebackers to try that they haven't tried all season. Um, when when you like see someone with a ball on the other team you take your arms and you wrap them up and then you tackle them. Like I I realize that they've tried the whole like tackling things without wrapping up. I think that this week they should probably wrap their arms around the ball carrier and make the tackle at that point. That's, that's a bold strategy. It's, it's innovative to football. I don't know if it's ever been done before, but I think Florida should try it this week and maybe see some success there because our linebackers need to be able to finish plays this week that are going to be, again, made by our defensive line, but the linebackers need to clean things up in order to walk away with a solid victory here because South Carolina is certainly not a team that should beat Florida. I don't care if the records are the same. Florida's got the fifth strongest strength of schedule this year so far. And the final prediction for our defense, there will be at least one South Carolina fumble. And I realize that's weird because I already said there's going to be a pick to then predict another turnover Given that our defense is not super ball hockey, um, they're they're just generally not. They've been hot recently, but for the vast majority of the season, they haven't been. But South Carolina, in the past four games, has lost not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, not six, but seven fumbles in the past four games. That's You've got to try to fumble that much at that point, including three in one game against Troy. So I'd like to think that Florida's got it where we can kind of force some fumbles here. And I'd like to imagine that. And again, I say I'd like to imagine because I don't trust Todd Grantham for Jack Diddley squat at this point. But I'd like to imagine that the Florida Gators are watching South Carolina games if they even do scouting defensively. I don't even know what the hell they do. But I'd like to imagine that the Gators are watching these games and saying, hmm, they, they got some ball security issues and going to attack and I want gang tackles similar to how Georgia forced the fumble on Anthony Richardson, which again, I've said I don't blame Anthony Richardson for that fumble at all because one, his own O-line is pushing him forward, thus meaning that you can't get the forward progress call. Two, Georgia's defenders were holding him up while one defender just kept ripping at the ball. And I don't know what you can expect from someone when all you can do is this. That's all you can do. And then you just got people trying to rip the ball out while other people are trying to drag you to the ground and your own team's trying to push you forward. So I don't fault him at all for that fumble. I would like to see Florida try doing that a little bit against running backs maybe because even then, I get it, running backs uh, are generally more secure as ball carriers than quarterbacks. But, I mean, you can only do so much. We saw Jacob Copeland fumble the same way against, I believe it was Kentucky, where he got held up. And someone ripped the ball out of his hands. And that's how he fumbled too. The Gators should start doing that, especially against teams like South Carolina, who have legitimately struggled with ball security. So defensive predictions, at least one interception. Because again, I think Florida at some point will force South Carolina to throw the ball deep. I'm assuming playing cover two or some kind of variant of that, where you kind of got to be, okay, well, we can't pass it short because they've got so many defenders underneath, so we're going to have to throw the ball deep. And I think that both of our secondaries, or both of our safeties, are good enough to make plays on the ball. South Carolina will have less than 100 rushing yards, which is going against the grain for what they've done so far this season. 
they've had over 100 rushing yards on five of their eight games. I was going to throw a percentage out there, but me dumb, bad math. So I didn't want to do that. And then South Carolina will fumble at least once because, again, they've lost seven, seven fumbles in the past four games. So I think that Florida really has to be aggressively attacking the football this week, whether it's in the air, on the ground, do whatever you can to get the ball back for your offense. Anybody else make money this weekend? I know I did because, you know, I, I just I was on fire. I ran a little bit of a heater, not going to brag, but, you know, it's a little bit of a heater on Bet Online. Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to place a bet on all of your sports action. I even won money betting on esports. Thanks, League of Legends. Proud of you. Obviously, Florida, you know, they, they lost this week and that threw a bit of a wrench because I bet that they would cover. I bet that they'd win. I bet that they'd hit the over and they did not, not, and not again. So that was really fun. Bet online covers award shows, TV shows, and reality TV with real time updated odds and props on almost anything you can imagine. It is the best way to place your bets and it's 100% free to sign up. Head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online, your online sportsbook experts. Make sure to use promo code locked on. That is L O C K E D, no space. Oh, and now we're going to look at some Gators in the pros that have been killing the passing game specifically. Obviously, I am not talking about throwing the football because um, we don't have quarterbacks that play in the NFL. But we do have Kadarius Tony, who did throw a pass to, I believe, Sterling Shepard on Monday Night Football, went for 19 yards. So that was really fun. I have him on my fantasy team. Those were his first points that he got for me for the day. So that was fun. But Kyle Pitts, Van Jefferson, and Kadarius Tony are the three Gators offensively that I wanted to talk about that are killing the passing game. I've got two defensive players to talk about who I've spoken about before, but I just want to circle back to them because they're great. Uh, but Kyle Pitts, Van Jefferson, and Kadarius Tony, of course, Kyle Pitts on the Falcons, Van Jefferson on the Rams, and Kadarius Tony on the Giants, are on pace to combine for 214 catches, 3,107 yards, and 10 touchdowns. Keep in mind, that is without Kadarius Tony scoring a touchdown to this point. That is with Kyle Pitts only scoring one touchdown to this point. Van Jefferson has been putting in work all three of these receivers are on pace for 750 yards or for over 750 yards individually combined yes they would average over a thousand but a lot of that's kyle pitts and then van jefferson is on pace for about 905 i believe it is so if he just picks it up a little bit just a little bit van jefferson could be a 1000 yard receiver which would be his first 1000 yard season of his career of course he was just drafted last year in the second round i believe 56th overall and then kyle pitch was drafted this year fourth overall he's been getting involved a lot in the offense this past week he did not have a great week for the falcons but i mean hey it, it happens the panthers have a very good defense a very good defensive coordinator i'm a big fan of phil snow since his baylor days so i i don't blame him for not having a great game and Kadarius tony while he has been playing well has been dealing with injuries. He had an ankle injury in the Cowboys game. This pat, and then he got hurt in the Rams game also. And then this past week, Monday, he injured his hand or wrist. It looked like still waiting for results on that. We've been told hand, but that's about it. So he's been dealing with injuries, which is lowering his pace because he hasn't been playing full games. He's been playing in the games, just not full games. And of course, at the start of the year, he was completely ghost in this offense defensively. Alex Anzalone and Vernon Hargraves the third are cover kings this year, which I realize is kind of weird to talk about both of those guys. Both of those players have reputations amongst their previous fan bases, some um, that were not positive. I realize that a lot of you guys hate Vernon Hargraves the third because a lot of you guys are Bucks fans and he did not work out with you guys at all. Alex Anzalone's issue, of course, was being hurt a lot in New Orleans, um, but he is healthy so far he's only missed four snaps this year i believe they've been playing great in coverage so far this year early in the season alex anceloni was on pace to give up almost a thousand receiving yards that is atrocious for anybody especially a linebacker which i realize people are like oh well linebackers are supposed to be worse in coverage yeah but they're not supposed to be targeted enough to give up a thousand receiving yards but alex anzalone was just there i believe he was at like 920 yards that he was projected to give up or on pace to give up but now he's on pace to give up only 378 yards alex anzalone has cleaned up better than anyone since jamie collins left the detroit lions alex anzalone has been having a career resurgent year 
with the Detroit Lions. Been playing phenomenal in coverage this past week. He was in coverage a lot on Dallas Goddard, and he played very well against one of the best young tight ends in the league. He has been a bright spot on this Detroit Lions defense, rejuvenating his career, revitalizing his career. And speaking of revitalizing their career, Vernon Hargraves the third. He's another guy who's similar to Kadarius Tony this year, has dealt with injuries during games this season, hasn't missed extended time because of it, but Vernon Hargraves the third is on pace to give up just 484 yards this season, which is 106 more than Alex Anzalone is on pace to give up, but that would easily and I'm when I I cannot stress this enough. That would easily be the best total for Vernon Hargraves in his career. And I I realize that yeah yeah easily could be a bit. I mean like you don't even understand how it, how huge this would be. Vernon Hargraves the third in his career besides 2018 because he only played one game in 2018. But his career low in yards allowed was in 2017 where he allowed 468 yards in nine games. He is on pace to allow up to allow four less yards in 17 games this year. So Vernon Hargraves has been playing phenomenal football in coverage. He's also only 26. It's the best year of his career by a huge margin. He's only 26 years old. He is in a career year. He could be one of those guys like Quentin Dunbar that we see get paid kind of after having such a phenomenal year and such a phenomenal comeback season because he's been playing just so stellar. To put a full season scope on things, Vernon Hargraves has only played two full 16-game seasons in his still young NFL career. That was 2016 with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, which you would all know, and 2020 with the Houston Texans last year. Last year, he allowed 837 receiving yards in those 16 games. And in 2016, he allowed over 1,000 yards in those 16 games with 1,067 receiving yards. He is on pace to give up less than half of his 2016 total. So he has just been playing a lights out. Very happy for him. I realize that a lot of you guys hate him, but maybe... uh. Maybe forgive the guy for sucking when he was young in the NFL and being overdrafted. It's as simple as that. He he was overdrafted. It's not like he it's not like he chose to go tenth overall or eleventh, but he was overdrafted by the Bucks. You should be mad at the Bucks for picking for making a bad pick, not mad at the player for struggling early in his career when he's shown that he is turning it around. So just five Gators that are absolutely killing the passing game, whether it's offensively, defensively. They're having phenomenal years, and two of them are having career revitalizing years. Three of them are very young in their careers and already showing a ton of promise. Thanks for making Lockdown Gators your first listen of the day every day. Tomorrow, we'll preview Florida, South Carolina with the keys to victory. Now make your second listen, Lockdown SEC. Get all of your daily SEC news in less than 30 minutes with SEC expert Chris Gordy of Sports 790. It is free and available on all platforms. For Locked On Gators, I am Brandon Olson. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at WNS underscore Brandon. I'm also the founder of Whole9Sports.com where you can find all of my written work. And don't forget to check out my pin tweet and let Locked On know why Gator Nation is the best fan base in all of college football. And I will see you all tomorrow.